My name is Michael Flyer. I'm the director of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, and I want to welcome you today, a very special day in the life of our institute, uh, the presentation of the Zenobia Sokoperi Memorial Lecture. Uh, this lecture series was actually inaugurated in the year 2000, and has featured commentary uh, of many prominent scholars on contemporary Ukrainian uh, politics and history. Uh, this lecture provides a time for all of us at the Institute to celebrate a close friend, uh, a brilliant but all too short career at Clark University and the Institute, a life that was taken from us well before its time. Uh, Xenia, which is what we all called it, uh, was a bright light in the field of Soviet and East European history and politics, a, spe a specialist on contemporary Ukraine in academic and government circles, who began her association with the Institute in the early 1980s. Her incisive analytic mind, her quick wit, her willingness to stand up for her convictions, her high standards won her an instant following here. She taught Ukrainian politics very successfully in our uh, Harvard Ukrainian Summer Institute, and in the mid-1990s was responsible for organizing a very successful uh, number of seminars at the Institute on Ukraine in a new East Central European context. Zenia was actually among the very first American scholars to teach in the Kiev Mohila Academy and earned the same high marks in the Ukrainian setting that she had garnered in the American. She demonstrated great courage in her long battle with cancer, and we feel her absence. We miss her irrepressible smile, and it's fitting that today's lecture uh, uh, really reflects so many of the things that interested her directly. We're delighted to have with us today uh, Zenia's husband, David, uh, his, her sister, Lesia, and some other members of the family. Welcome. Uh, I want to, first of all, simply tell you before we begin our, our uh, roundtable that after the roundtable, uh, we at the Institute invite you all to go across the street to Sieges North on the first floor the northernmost part, if you go through the north door, you're out of it. <laughs> we have a nice reception waiting for you afterwards where we continue the discussion uh, that will begin here. So without further ado, let me uh, say a few words about our panel, uh, and this is the order that they'll speak. Uh, David Kramer received his uh, BA at Tufts University in Soviet Studies and Political Science, and then at Harvard University, uh, his MA in Social Studies. Soviet studies. Soviet studies, sorry. Uh, he was a lecturer in Russian studies at Clark University at uh, Zenia's home institution. And uh, he was also the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor from 2008 to 2009. He became Executive Director of Freedom House in October of 2010. <coughs> Our second speaker is Orest uh, Dejakiewski who has been with the uh, United States Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe. He's a policy advisor for Belarus, Bulgaria, Romania, and Ukraine. He received his uh, BA from the University of Notre Dame and his MA from Georgetown University in Government and International Relations. And our third speaker, Damon Wilson, is Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council who serves as a thought leader and manager with responsibility for strategy and strategic initiatives, program development and integration, and institutional development and organizational effectiveness. His work is committed to advancing a European whole, free, and at peace to include Europe's east, which of course is going to interest us today, the Western Balkans and the Black Sea region, to strengthening the NATO alliance and to fostering a transatlantic partnership capable of tackling global challenges. He is a graduate of Duke University and uh, Princeton's uh, Woodrow Wilson Institute. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this roundtable over to our moderator, our Associate Director of the Institute, Dr. Lubomir Haida, who will get things going. Thank you. Well, thank much. you, Michael. I think you did my work for me. Nothing remains but to call on our first speaker, and Professor Flyer introduced them in the order in which they will be speaking, uh, David Kramer, please. Luca, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you for hosting us in the Institute. It's great to be back here um, and to see a number of long-time, I won't say old friends, but a number of long-time friends from uh, my days when I was a student here. 
and was hanging around uh, the center uh, with many people uh, who are here today. So thanks very much for having us back. Um, it is also particularly fitting uh, for me to join you here today. Um, as you mentioned, Michael, uh, I was a lecturer at Clark University uh, dealing with Soviet studies back then, and that was thanks to Zania, who had asked me back in 1989 if I would be willing to step in uh, and offer a course that she had been doing at that time, um, and I wound up doing it for two years, and it was a wonderful experience. Uh, Clark University is a great little school, um, and she was just a, an unbelievably terrific person, as you rightly pointed out. One of the most decent people I had ever met, um, but also one with just an incredibly sharp, keen mind, and it was a, a real privilege to know her. The only downside was uh, when I was lecturing at Clark University, um, there were two times where I was stopped for speeding coming back to Cambridge <laughs> on Route 9, uh, but I don't hold that against any of it. In any case, that was my fault. Um, we are here to uh, talk about, uh, Luca had asked us to come up, all three of us from Washington, to talk about the trajectory of democracy and freedom in Ukraine. And I guess I would sum it up by saying it does not look good. Um, and it hasn't looked good for a number of years. Um, I have approached Ukraine both in the think tank world and the nonprofit human rights world, but also uh, as someone who worked in the U.S. government for eight years and had a lot of contact with Ukrainian officials. One of the other positions I had in the State Department was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. Um, and that was a challenging job, to say the least. Um, but in dealing with Ukraine, particularly from the summer of 2005 till uh, 2008, um, it was a time of significant ups and downs. And unfortunately, I would say there were more downs than, than ups. And, and that's where I want to start, uh, which is to say that I uh, approach looking at Ukraine from, say, the time of 2004, after the Orange Revolution in a time of great hope and expectation, I think all, all of us in Washington remember when Viktor Yushchenko came to Washington, spoke before a joint session of the U.S. Congress in April of 2005, and in some respects we had put him on a, a pedestal that he could never live up to. The, the only trajectory he was going to be on was down. Unfortunately, we didn't know how quickly he would go down that path. Um, and the year 2005, I think, really was the beginning of the shattering of expectations from the orange crowd, so to speak, where we saw tremendous infighting, in particular between the two top leaders, uh, Yushchenko's president and Yulia Tymoshenko's prime minister, until uh, she was forced out in September of 2005. The, the decline, I would say, accelerated um, in January 2006, when days after Russia cut off gas to Ukraine, Ukraine signed a deal, a gas deal with Russia, that when we were in the US government, we were trying to get copies of the deal and try to get details about the deal because something just didn't seem right about it. Uh, there, Ukraine had the world's sympathy in the palm of its hands for four days, and suddenly a deal was closed, and we suspected that there was something untoward about it. Um, and I think that we can say this now, we estimated uh, back then that the deal was worth some $2 billion to people very close to the then Ukrainian president. Neither Viktor, Yush uh, Viktor Yanukovych, rather, nor Yulia Tymoshenko was prime minister at that time. Viktor Yushchenko was the president, and he was the one responsible for that deal. And I would argue things went quickly downhill from there. So I, I certainly don't approach looking at Ukraine today under Viktor Yanukovych as one who thought the days of the orange leadership was a glass completely full. I would say it was even less than half full. Um, and it was a time of, of terribly, uh, terrible unmet expectations uh, in, in those days. Um, the, the one good thing I would cite, and there were, there were more than one, but one, the one I would cite, was that there were free and fair elections in, in Ukraine under, under Yushchenko's leadership including the election that led to Yushchenko's uh, uh, defeat, political defeat, and the victory of uh, Viktor Yanukovych over Yulia Tymoshenko. Having said that, however, I would also suggest that the decision by Yushchenko to uh, make Yulia Tymoshenko hit the target of his opposition's venom uh, 
um, in that election led ironically to the victory of the man who certainly was not behind his poisoning in 2004, but presumably knew the people who were. Um, and so it certainly made for odd bedfellows that Yushchenko wound up focusing his energies and effort against Timoshenko to allow Viktor Yanukovych to become president. Um, which, which brings me to Yanukovych in the, in the present uh, period, or at least the past two and a half years. And I would argue that to Yanukovych, the February 2010 election victory was a re-election, not an election. In Yanukovych's mind, and I say this as somebody who has met with him numerous times, both when I was in the government and since I've left the government, he thinks he won the 2004 election. And he thinks the victory was taken from him. And I would argue he points the finger more at Yulia Tymoshenko than he does at Viktor Yushchenko. Um, and so for Yanukovych, the January-February 2010 election was a vindication. It was for him his way to return to power, not take power, return to power, um, after what was uh, the, the events of 2004, what was stolen from him then. And it also triggered, I think, in his mind, this obsession he has with Yulia Tymoshenko. It's an obsession, by the way, that Viktor Yushchenko shares. Um, having Damon and I, uh, as part of the Freedom House delegation, met with Yushchenko the last time we saw him was in uh, 2011, the spring of 2011. And almost every other sentence out of Yushchenko's mouth was about Yulia Tymoshenko. The same with Viktor Yanukovych. The last time I saw him was in April of this year, uh, again as part of a Freedom House delegation, a 90-minute meeting, 90% 90 of which I would say was about her. And that was not my intention, but it was his uh, desire to keep returning to her as the subject. Um, I mentioned these, these delegations that we've taken. Uh, for the past two years, Freedom House has done a special report on Ukraine. Last year's report was called Sounding the Alarm, Protecting Democracy in Ukraine. This year's report was Sounding the Alarm Round 2. Uh, protecting Democracy in Ukraine, hoping, instead of coming up with a new jazzy title, that this time we'd finally get people's attention and let them know that there really is reason to be concerned about what's happening in Ukraine. Um, and we decided to do this report in part because of my own special interest, as head of the organization, I do have some liberty to choose the things we want to focus on, but secondly because we, we were very concerned about the direction Ukraine is taking. Um, and third, We've also felt that the deterioration in Ukraine is by no means irreversible. That there is still the possibility to try to influence and shape things in Ukraine in a more positive way. And I have to say um, that my thinking of this last point, that things are not irreversible, that there's still an opportunity to shape things, is not as firm as it used to be. Uh, I've become more frustrated at the ability of the outside community to say nothing of those inside Ukraine to try to influence the situation in a more positive direction, though I'm by no means defeatist on this point. Last year's report cited a number of areas that we felt were particularly disturbing and cause for concern. So we warned about the consolidation of power at the expense of democratic development in the country where Yanukovych and those closely around him were definitely trying to concentrate power into their hands. We highlighted the pressure on the media, which was in uh, facing uh, unprecedented pressure since events of the Orange Revolution in 2004. We of course cited the selective prosecution of the opposition. Uh, Yuri Lutsenko was already in prison, Yulia Tymoshenko at this point was not, but she was uh, in the process of facing charges. Um, and there were other people from the previous government who were also facing charges and also in jail. We cited the growing intrusiveness of the SBU, the Special Services, which uh, by 2011 at this point had paid visits to Kiev Mihaila Academy and to others, and there was this sense that the SBU was in fact on the rise. And we raised these issues uh, with the head, then head of the SBU, Mr. Horshkovsky. Um, we also arrived in Ukraine in 2011 after the bad election, uh, bad local elections in October 2010, which broke 
the trend that we had seen uh, since really the rerun of the election in 2004 of elections that passed the free and fair test. The other, another concern we cited was the rubber stamp RADA. The RADA really was just a, a rubber stamp of what Yanukovych and Party of Regions wanted. There really wasn't much debate of any kind, and what Yanukovych wanted to get passed would, in fact, get pushed through the RADA. And then last was the growing problem of corruption. I mentioned the gas deal signed in January 2006 as an example of corruption in Ukraine before Yanukovych came to power. I don't mean to suggest that corruption is a new phenomenon in Ukraine that has only emerged under Yanukovych, but I would argue that the problem of corruption has gotten exponentially worse in the past two plus years. So we concluded our report last year with the, with the following warning. We said Ukraine under President Yanukovych, and this was in the summer of 2011, Ukraine under President Yanukovych has become less democratic and if current trends are left unchecked, may head toward a path toward uh, may head down a path toward autocracy and kleptocracy. And I would argue that events since the report in 2011 and the report that we just issued a few months ago would indicate that that warning has come true. So that was last year. This year's report, in most areas, as I say, suggests that the areas of concern have even gotten worse. But there is one area that we felt, based on the visit we made in April of this year, where we thought the situation has gotten considerably better, and that's in the area of civil society. In the spring and summer of 2011, we found civil society quite dispirited, down after the experience of the orange period and the return to power of the blue forces. But, that, but this year, we detected that civil society was more animated, was more active, there had been a terrible tragedy uh, of a woman who was, who was uh, raped and, and burned and, and killed. Um, and civil society mobilized around this terrible tragedy in, in the spring of this year and demanded justice after two suspects who had initially been detained were then let go by the authorities because there was an assumption that they had powerful connections. Civil society seems to have gotten more exercised about the situation in Ukraine and less resigned that this is where Ukraine's going for the rest of its days. And so I think this is a positive development that we've seen, but they, a civil society also needs a positive message. It can't simply be against something, um, and that I think is still a, a need that has been unfilled. Um, this year's visit that Freedom House paid, and it was uh, Damon and myself, uh, Bob Nurek, who's also affiliated with the Atlantic Council, and this year we also included two Ukrainians in our assessment team. Uh, this year's visit came after a terrible mayor election in Abukhov, um, where there was wide condemnation that there was significant fraud uh, in fixing of, of this election. So once again, after the local elections in October of 2010, this mayoral election was further evidence that the uh, blue forces were intent on fixing elections, undoing what was arguably, as I mentioned, one of the successes of the, of the Yushchenko period, which was having elections that passed the free and fair test. There were growing concerns about freedom of assembly and crackdowns by authorities on the ability to congregate, to protest, to organize rallies and, and, and other things. Um, we also saw rising pressure on the media, and I think Oris will touch on this uh, when he talks about the election period, uh, where we've seen the efforts by the authorities, particularly in the broadcast media, trying to concentrate uh, the broadcast media and reduce the diversity uh, that, that had existed before. Um, we've also seen bad legislation. Um, and it in, has involved not just the Russian language issue, but the minority language issue, as it's been described, uh, which was passed in an absurd fashion through the RADA, further evidence of the rubber stamping of the RADA. Um, but it, it has extended to even the consideration of recriminalizing defamation, although the RADA has decided not to pursue that, at least for the time being. It also includes uh, legislation that's being considered that would criminalize the quote-unquote promotion of a homosexual agenda, uh, which is also something that the Europeans and many others are urging the Ukrainians not to move forward on. Um, 
there, there has been some positive legislation. I don't want to paint an entirely bleak negative picture about uh, the RADA's activities. There was legislation passed dealing with NGOs on access to government, uh, open information. Those have been positive. But for the most part, I would argue, the RADA has not been a positive force in, in Ukrainian society. There's also the further problem of corruption, which I've mentioned before, not a new phenomenon. Um, but the new element of this that we heard in April of this year when we were in Ukraine was the term familyization, which is to say that the family of Viktor Yanukovych is directly benefiting from his position of power. And his son, in fact, Alexander, uh, who has become one of, if not the richest Ukrainian in, uh, in a very brief period of time. He's a dentist by training, so he must be doing a hell of a lot of fillings. Uh, his uh, income increased some 18 times last year. Hard to explain exactly how, unless it was done in ways that uh, the Yanukovych family does not want to see told by anyone. Transparency International does its annual corruption index. Ukraine has dropped from 134th place, not a very good showing to start with, down to 152. And so the problem of corruption is our turn to steal. The problem with this, of course, is that when government officials engage in corruption and stealing, they don't want to give up power. Because if they give up power, there might be investigations of them, and they might be sitting in jail if the opposition were to come to power. It's a vicious circle of corruption um, and undemocratic, even authoritarian uh, ways of, of ruling that feed into each other. And, and the, these two things, I would argue, selective prosecutions and corruption, pose the greatest threats to Ukraine's ability to move forward in a more democratic direction, to preserve and protect its sovereignty, uh, its independence. I, I don't subscribe to the view that Russia poses a threat to Ukraine's independence and sovereignty. Sadly, I, I have to say, I think Russian officials have concluded the Ukrainians, uh, uh, Ukrainian leadership, both orange and blue, are doing a su sufficiently good job themselves of undermining it. But the Russians don't need to. However, the Russians always overplay their hand, um, so I don't rule out the possibility that that will happen either. Um, the, the, our report this year uh, warned about the, the problems, the two greatest factors undermining Ukraine's democracy, selective prosecutions, and the expansion of corruption. And we say that the criminalization of politics threatens to extinguish democracy in Ukraine, which would lead to the end of the idea of Ukraine and Europe, which Damon's going to talk about. So in our assessment, based on the two trips we've taken, the two reports that we've carried out at Freedom House, um, we would argue that the grievous threats to Ukraine's future lie within, not from without. So I, I, will, I will end with this um, and say that uh, we remain very concerned about the direction Ukraine is going. Aside from these two special reports the Freedom House has done, we downgraded Ukraine in January of 2011 from the free category, where perhaps we were a little too generous in retrospect, into the partly free category. We rank countries into these free, partly free, and not free categories. Um, Ukraine continues to slip down further from the free category into the partly free, and I certainly, certainly hope that it won't slip further down into the not free category before too long. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. In a personal crusade to promote freedom, I have allowed the speakers to either stand at the podium or speak sitting down, and Boris Dijakovsky has chosen to speak sitting down. So, uh, Boris, please. I want to explain why I'll, I'm sitting down, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Luca. Thanks uh, to Guri for inviting me, and I'm um, pleased to be here with two good friends of mine with whom I've worked uh, over the years both within government and outside of government. Um, it's been a while since I've been here. I was here once in 93 speaking about national minorities in Ukraine. 
Uh, but my most poignant memories of Harvard are from 35 years ago, the summer of 1977, when I attended the Harvard Ukrainian Summer Institute, which of course is a project of Uri. At the time, Mykola Rudenko, the founder of the Ukrainian Helsinki Group, a group of courageous individuals uh, who monitored the Soviet government's compliance with the human rights provisions of the 1975 Helsinki Final Act, I know this will resonate with Tanya Yankilovich, um, was he, at that time he was sentenced to a seven-year term in the Gulag for his human rights activity, along with his fellow monitor, Alexa Tehi, who received even a harsher sentence and later ended up dying in a perm labor camp in the Gulag. Now in response, we at that time mostly Ukrainian-American students organized and staged a 24-hour hunger strike protest in, in Harvard Yard. Uh, now, since then, obviously, dramatic historic changes have, have taken place. The USSR has been relegated to the dustbin of history. Uh, the scale of human rights repressions in large parts of the post-Soviet world <coughs> have been reduced, although there are some exceptions. Ukraine, of course, is independent and overall a better place with respect to human rights and democracy. But some of the remnants, many of them, in fact, all too many of the Soviet systems still haunt Ukraine. And in preparing my remarks, I couldn't help notice the parallel that Yulia Timoshenko, who was convicted a year ago yesterday, received the same seven-year sentence that did Mykola Rudenko. Now, I fully appreciate that uh, comparing Timoshenko and Rudenko is comparing uh, apples and oranges to a certain extent. And as David said, she was no angel. In fact, Rudenko, uh, as those of us know in Helsinki monitors, uh, basically were sentenced for expressing their beliefs. Uh, however, I do want to state at the outset that the politically motivated, unjust, egregious imprisonment of Timoshenko and of former Interior Minister Yuri Lutsenko are the most visible, starkest illustration of Ukraine's democratic regression. I'll just punctuate David's remarks by saying, you know, putting aside what one might think of them or of Yulia Timoshenko's 2009 gas deal with Russia, um, the criminalization of a political decision in patently unfair trials and the subsequent piling on of dubious charge after dubious charge simply has no place in a country that uh, uh, is about to take over in two and a half months, the OSCE chairmanship, and the OSCE mm -hmm. is of course based on the 1975 Helsinki Final Act, or a country that aspires to European values and European integration. I'll focus the remainder of my remarks on the parliamentary elections, which are just two weeks away, not only because of their timeliness, but because they will be a key indicator as to Ukraine's future course. Uh, and I'll focus uh, on aspects of the environment of the elections themselves, how international observers, particularly OSC, might assess the elections and touch upon uh, the implications of any assessments, possible <coughs> reactions in the U.S. Congress. According to the OSC, the new electoral law does provide an overall sound foundation for the conduct of democratic elections if implemented properly. Of course, as in so many other areas of life, implementation is the key. Uh, there are clearly some positive changes, but there are some aspects of election uh, that have been criticized, uh, notably, for example, the return to the so-called mixed system, last used in 2002, where half of the 450 seats are chosen via party lists, and the other half by what's known as first-past-the-post individual constituency races. Uh, which opens up greater possibilities for pressures and, um, you know, opens up advantages for the ruling party. Uh, also, the threshold for the entry to the other was raised from 3% to 5%. But frankly, I don't have much of a problem with those decisions, as most of the opposition also supported that election law, so it was adopted democratically. Uh, versus what David referred to as the more often than not rubber stamping that has occurred in the last few years. Now one problem, and excuse me for drilling down to the weeds a little bit, but I think I, I, I will on, in some areas. 
One problem observers note with the selection process for members of the district election commissions and precinct election commissions responsible for administering the elections. Namely, there was a single winner-take-all lottery instead of separate lotteries for each district. The problem with that was it resulted in many of these smaller unknown parties, some so-called technical parties, many believed essentially to be fronts for the pro-Yanukovych, the ruling regions party, obtaining many seats on these electoral commissions, while others, including more established parties with many candidates running nationwide, such as Klitschko, the famous boxers, Udar uh, party, uh, which by the way now is polling second to the regions party, even a little bit ahead of the united opposition, or uh, Svoboda, which is expected to pass the threshold, they're the more nationalist party, not receiving any seats on the commissions, at least the district electoral commissions. So there's a disbalance, and the problem with that is having unbalanced election commissions gives the regime the chance to stack these commissions, at least to some extent, so that obviously provides an advantage in, in issues such as a case of disputed voting results. Um, and membership of commissions is crucial. Um, uh, I just got back from Belarus and I saw that with my own eyes. When you had a situation where, where only one, less than one half of one percent of the composition of election commissions was people from the opposition, you, you knew right then and there that you had a big problem, you know, because there's no checks and balances. Um, with respect to the registration process, I won't go, it went relatively smoothly, although some 400 out of the 3,000 candidates running for the 225 single mandate districts, so you have a lot of people running, uh, were re rejected by the Central Election Commission, offered from minor omissions in their documentation. And of course, most notably, Timoshenko and Lutsenko were deemed ineligible to run. There are a range of concerns with the present campaign, with the disproportionate number of violations and irregularities reported, mostly coming courtesy of the Regions Party. Um, there are numerous allegations of indirect vote buying, the use of administrative resources, you know, public finance projects are presented as personal candidate achievements. Uh, there are reports of the distribution of gift packages or simply envelopes stuffed with money. <laughs> Several independent and opposition candidates and campaign workers have been beaten, splashed with paint, threatened. The campaign office has been destroyed. Others have faced intimidation, often courtesy of the tax authorities, arrest, criminal charges, investigations. Uh, summonings for interrogations, threats against businesses or loss of employment. Some have been pressured to withdraw from the race. And then there's been all sorts of, you know, less egregious sort of um, uh, pressure tactics. I don't want to say these are widespread, but uh, there are enough of them, I think, to cause some concerns. So, in general, while generally if imperfectly competitive, and these elections, judging by the campaign and the activity in campaign, do appear to be competitive, as opposed to, again, uh, the Belarusian elections, which simply were not. Um, but we're not always seeing the most, the cleanest of campaigns. There is the possibility of vote rigging, but again, I don't see that uh, becoming a widespread phenomenon, as in 2004, those were the bad elections that precipitated the Orange Revolution. Um, although imperfect and uneven, again, there will, the election commissions will represent, the various parties will be represented on the election commissions. Uh, not on all of them, maybe, there'll be a disbalance, but they'll be with these commissioners representing various parties. Uh, plus the domestic and international observers watching, that should diminish, not eliminate, but diminish uh, the chances of cheating. There are some concerns of what we might see in the district electoral commissions where the electronic tabulation of precinct vote counts is done, where only some commission members will have access to the room. 
while other commission members as well as party representatives and observers will allegedly not be allowed in. Obviously, this could be problematic because that's where the tabulation is done. Another concern, for instance, is that web cameras installed in every precinct will broadcast live views of the voting stations, not of the people actually voting, obviously, but of the voting stations, but they won't of the vote count. So that could be problematic, too. Um, although I should add that all these things could change because every day it seems the Central Election Commission makes changes. So there's still two weeks left. We'll see what happens. Now, a word on the language law, uh, which David may mention, of uh, within the context of the election campaign. The law provides, as you know, the option to use other languages for official purposes and in court if it's spoken by over 10% of the population of a given region. The law, I think, is primarily an attempt of the regions to obtain votes as their popularity has diminished since Yanukovych took office, even in their traditional base. And the jury's still out, and I keep hearing conflicting things as to whether the law has worked to the region's advantage or not electorally. But on a substantive note, I just want to quote what Newt Volabek, the OSC High Commissioner and National Minorities and former Norwegian Foreign Minister, stated about the law, and that is, the disproportionate favoring of the Russian language while also removing most incentives for learning or using Ukrainian in large parts of the country could potentially undermine Ukraine's very cohesion. He warned that the law is likely to lead to further polarization. Now, a few words on the media. Uh, I think we have a broad sense of what's happened there. Uh, the Ukrainian media market, of course, is monopolized by a small circle of uh, people and business entities linked to the government. The number of paid media materials, they're known as GINSA, uh, apparently because money's stuffed in the back pockets of reporters' jeans for favorable articles, has grown in Ukraine, which indicates that uh, editors and journalists, frankly, are bribed more often, and self-censorship has been growing in the country. The OSCE, in its first interim election report, stated that the media environment in a current election campaign is characterized by a significant lack of political pluralism on television. And of course, television is the medium from which the vast majority of Ukrainians obtain their information, their news. Now, monitoring of press freedom shows that the party of regions dominates the media in all regions, but Ivana Frankivsk Oblast. With one August monitoring of 230 regional media outlets showing a huge advantage of media coverage for the government, and in Donetsk, which is Yanukovych's home base, a hundred times the media coverage of the opposition. On the other hand, and when one's talking about Ukraine, there are always a lot of on the one hands and on the other hands. Uh, monitoring in late September and early October, just from last week shows that the political advertising of the opposition parties on the leading TV channels, most of whom are owned by oligarchs close to the government, actually exceeds that of pro-government parties. And they actually, uh, the opposition, apparently receive more coverage on the most popular political talk shows. Uh, now, I won't go on TV, well, TVI, the only nationwide TV station broadcasting very critical investigative programs, um, in particular has experienced some restrictions. Uh, they were, among other things, they, they've, been, they've been basically kicked off, excluded from some cable networks. Um, and um, Last month, a court in Kiev had charged TVI with tax evasion. The government temporarily froze their accounts. But following widespread criticism at home and abroad, Yanukovych backed down, at least for the time being. Um, and David touched by, you know, another example of Yanukovych's backing down was when he rescinded the reactionary law that would have recriminalized defamation. This happened just last week, I believe. Uh, and that was also due to strong internal and external international pressure. So that kind of indicates that even Yanukovych, and believe me, I'm no fan of his, um, is, is uh, capable sometimes of, um, of uh, 
of, well, susceptible, if you will, to pressure in some instances. Despite all the shortcomings, just to sum up on elections, these elections do remain competitive. They're certainly better than most others in the post-Soviet space, although admittedly that's not a very high bar. Uh, I, I recently, again, returned from the Belarusian elections, and you know, afterwards, if anybody wants to hear more about that, this is about Ukraine, not Belarus, but trust me, the, the Ukrainian elections have their flaws, but they have to work very hard to match last month's uh, Belarusian elections, or for that matter, elections in, um, I would say, most of the post-Soviet uh, world. This leads me to discussion of OSC election observation missions, including the one already present in Ukraine with 100 long-term observers and will include more than 600 short-term observers representing the majority of the 56 OSC countries. The fact of the matter is, and I say this with all due respect to friends of mine involved with other international monitoring missions or people from IRI, NDI, the Ukrainian diaspora or whatnot, but the, it, it is the OSCE-led observation missions, which also often include EU parliamentarians and uh, various European institutions, representatives. Um, but those have become the most authoritative missions. And the OSC pronouncements that are held, at least in the post-Soviet countries, I'm not saying worldwide, I'm saying in the OSC region. And the OSC pronouncements held at the day after election press conferences are those from which the U.S. and European governments really take their cues in issuing their own statements assessing the elections. So what the OSCE reports uh, post-election matters. What are the factors that will influence these assessments? Obviously the imprisonment of the opposition leaders, media, the fairness and transparency of the entire election process itself from registration to campaign to voting to counting to tabulation to the adjudication of complaints, uh, which there's also some issues and problems with, but I don't think we have time to get into that here. Um, uh, so it's, a, but it, one thing, it's important to clear up a misconception that many have which is that elections are assessed by the OSC and others as either free or fair or not free and fair. And I see a lot of this uh, in, in Ukraine where a lot of people um, think it's more of a pass-fail system, you know, either an A or an M. Rather, I think it's best to think of these assessments in terms of a grading system ranging, let's say, from an A to F. Uh, and actually, many, if not most, virtually all of the OSC post-election statements, as both Damon and David know, tend to be rather nuanced in their pronouncements, uh, diplomatic, one might say, Un unless an election is, you know, either so good that they'll occasionally, you know, give it the come save fully meets democratic standards in every respect, or it's so bad that you can't help but almost condemn it. So I caution those who think that the international community will assess these elections as not being free or fair only by virtue of the fact of the denial of the participation of Timoshenko and Lutsenko. And on the other hand, it'd be impossible for the OSCE to find these elections as fully meeting international democratic standards by virtue of these imprisonments alone even if everything else was to go swimmingly, which uh, that won't happen. It's also noteworthy that these elections will inevitably be perceived uh, by governments in the public eye against the backdrop of past Ukrainian elections, especially last four uh, nationwide elections that were assessed quite favorably, quite positively by the OSC and other international observers, as, as David had indicated. Uh, now, I'm going to venture to make a prediction, ignoring perhaps to my detriment Casey Stengel's admonition or malapropism, which is never make predictions about the future. But <laughs> the elections will probably be characterized as partially free, or partially meeting international standards. They won't be either a resounding success, but I don't see them as being an abject failure, neither an A or an F. Why? Because for all the election 
related flaws or irregularities I've outlined, um, there are still enough checks and balances within the electoral system and the larger society to keep them from becoming seriously flawed. Although clearly under threat from the Yanukovych regime, political pluralism, civil society, as David mentioned, and independent media have by no means disappeared in Ukraine. And they do provide at least some degree of counterbalance to the, to the regime. Another reason is that I don't think Yanukovych wants these elections to be judged too negatively. He's already become a semi-international pariah and it's important for him to try to convince the West that the elections are at least relatively free and fair, good enough, or at least okay enough. Uh, I think he wants to, to some extent, refurbish his image, especially given his obstinacy on the Timoshenko case. And, and I unfortunately think that that obstinacy on that particular case, maybe on the Lutsenko case, I think that could see the possibility of some give, but on Timoshenko, for some of the reasons that, that David talked about it in your meetings with the Yanukovych, who says, I'm very pessimistic about that. Now what happens, oh, moreover, I gotta give this a plug, because uh, there's the prestige also, and he's at least somewhat mindful of that, his foreign minister, Hrishchenko certainly is, there's the prestige for Ukraine of uh, the upcoming 2013 uh, Ukrainian chairmanship of the OSCE, and that would be tarnished with a bad election. He doesn't want, it's already been tarnished with some of the other democratic regressions. I don't think he wants it to become even more tarnished. What happens after the elections? Should they be seriously fraudulent and the status quo persists? with respect to Timoshenko, Lutsenko, then the possibility of sanctions limited targeted against officials responsible for the bad behavior increases significantly. The Senate recently passed a resolution uh, more narrowly tailored on the Timoshenko case calling on the State Department to institute a visa ban against those responsible for her and others' imprisonments and mistreatment. And while it hasn't passed, our House resolution sponsored by my chairman, Helsinki Commission Chairman Representative Chris Smith, uh, also calls for the release of Timoshenko Lutsenko, but urges free, fair, and transparent elections in addition to that, and calls for the denying of U.S. visas to a broader category of Ukrainian officials. Now, mind you, this is a resolution, not a public law, so it's not mandatory. But it, does serve as a signal and did serve as a warning, and uh, I, I've seen that from my own direct interactions uh, with the foreign ministry and with Ukrainian officials, as well as uh, with the opposition, um, uh, although they're interested in the sanctions for obviously different reasons. Um, I would not completely exclude the possibility that further serious democratic regression in Ukraine, and I think it would have to deteriorate uh, substantially, I think it still has a while to go, could open the door for more serious punitive legislation, such as uh, public laws like the Belarus Democracy Act, uh, which was also sponsored by Helsinki Commission Chairman uh, Chris Smith, and which uh, Damon, David, and I uh, all all had a role in, um, and uh, as well as the, and some of you probably heard of it, the uh, Sergei Magnitsky registration pertaining to Russia, which was initiated by our co-chairman, Senator Ben Cardin, including an independent judiciary, and where corruption, especially among the country's political elites, becomes the exception rather than the rule. And more immediately, what this means is a Ukraine with elections that meet international democratic standards, the cessation of the so-called selective prosecutions, and the release of uh, the politically in prison. Thank you. Uh, we had one stander, one sitter, uh, Mr. Wilson. We will stand. Uh, Damien Wilson, please. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, I want to thank the Ukrainian uh, Research Institute for having us up to Boston for this conversation today. 
Uh, it's a real honor to be here as part of this uh, memorial symposium, particularly with these two colleagues, with David Kramer and Orst, um, both good colleagues that have had the chance to work on, on Ukraine over the years, but also have become uh, personal friends. Um, I also want to thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon for this conversation on Ukraine. Um, David has set out very well the context for our conversation, the overall state of democracy and freedom in Ukraine, drawing on the report uh, that Freedom House put out that I had the pleasure to, to participate in a mission with David on earlier this year. You've just heard from Orest about the details of the election, and there's no better expert, uh, Orest will be in Ukraine observing these elections, to walk you through that. What I'd like to do now is to broaden the conversation, to link what we've been talking about domestically and internally in Ukraine to the international agenda and Ukraine's place in the world. Um, and my theme is the direct link between what happens internally in Ukraine and where Ukraine finds itself in the world, um, the link between the internal and the international. Um, the fundamental issue I think that we're actually talking about through all of this conversation um, is not just the state of Ukraine's democracy, but it's Ukraine and Europe, or more pointedly, Ukraine and the West, question um, mark. 20 years, just 20 years of, a, of independence and sovereignty isn't a long time in the historical record. And I think what's playing out through this election cycle is directly related to the prospect of Ukrainian sovereignty and independence over the long term, and how long, will, how long Ukraine will be able to stand by true independence and sovereignty, preserve and build on those 20 years that it's had as an independent state. So my connection to this conversation and my connection to Ukraine isn't really from the Russian and Soviet studies or from Ukraine studies itself. Mine is a policy career uh, where I've been engaged in working uh, throughout my career on the process of helping former adversaries become allies of the United States. I worked at NATO, at the State Department, at the White House, uh, all in the context of helping to work first in Central and Eastern Europe, the Baltic states, the Western Balkans, and then increasingly Ukraine and Georgia through this dramatic historic transformation that's play, can, taken place uh, in Europe and Europe's East. Um, I began at the State Department working on NATO policy. I worked at the National Security Council uh, three different times in the Clinton administration and the Bush administration on European issues. And I served at NATO during the largest expansion of the alliance. Um, I've had the opportunity to work on every NATO summit since 1999 when we first welcomed Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary into the alliance. And so what I'm even beginning with, and what I'm going to talk a little bit, is actually off the agenda today. It sounds a little discordant. Um, it's this idea of Ukraine in the West, Ukraine in Europe, and certainly Ukraine NATO. And that's not really today's agenda, unfortunately. But I want to argue that I think it's the responsibility for those of us that care about Ukraine's position in the world to think about it strategically now. Um, that we help create options for Ukraine's future, to keep some of these options open, um, and that we not be naive about what's happening with the Russian leadership and the Russian um, psyche that still really struggles to actually accept the idea of an independent sovereign Ukraine um, as reality. So the premise of, uh, of all of my conversation today um, is that Ukraine, I still believe, is really actually a linchpin of European security and stability. The ambiguity about its place, it's ambivalent about its place in Europe, actually has the potential for instability and insecurity over the time. And we shouldn't be um, blasé about that. Um, Ukraine is in a gray zone, and that is, that's a risky, um, a risky place to be uh, for Ukraine itself and for our own interests. So I want to give a little bit of a, a, a start off uh, this conversation with a little bit of an anecdote, which I'll call the tale of two summits. And I had the opportunity earlier this year to be in Chicago at the NATO summit where Ukraine, President Yanukovych was there, but Ukraine was frankly off the agenda. But I also was very much involved as one of the policy architects at the Bucharest summit in 2008, four years earlier, where Ukraine was at the heart of the agenda. The Bucharest summit in, in Romania, a, a summit that took, uh, a NATO summit that took place closest to Ukraine geographically, um, was really ground zero for a discussion about Ukraine's place in, in the world and Ukraine's place in Europe. I was working at the National Security Council at the time, and I had been working there um, through the process uh, during the lead up, during the Orange Revolution, working with David Kramer, the State Department, Forrest on the Hill, um, where there had been a tremendous amount of progress on US policy uh, in uh, lifting Jackson Bannock on Ukraine and getting Ukraine into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, 
designating as a market economy status. So a lot of progress on issues that had been blocked over the years. And so in 2006, uh, at the National Security Council, I began to argue for and plan a presidential visit to Kiev, feeling very strongly that uh, this was a time to send an American president into Ukraine, uh, to send a signal to uh, the, give a shot of wind in the sails, if you will, of the opportunity for, for, uh, to reform behind the orange leaders at the time, and an opportunity to really open a viable conversation about Ukraine's place in Europe, its pact towards the European Union, and also NATO at the time. And so I stuck my neck out at the National Security Council, and I went forward and made a strong case to argue that even though the Ukrainians hadn't agreed on a government, this was in 2006 when Tymoshenko and Yushchenko had not been able to agree in the wake of parliament and elections to form a coalition government, I argued that we needed to put U.S. prestige on the line and say, look, the President of the United States will come to Ukraine if you form your coalition government, get your act together, and provide a platform for the Americans to come in. And this, was, this would have been a big deal in U.S. policy to be present and supportive of this historic transition that's taking place in the country. We, perhaps naively thinking that this was quite a bit to offer, a package of both symbolism and substance to support Ukraine's transition. And we had quite a bit of time to plan this. And the Ukrainians failed. Tymoshenko and Yushchenko couldn't come to an agreement. And I found myself um, almost out of a job at the White House uh, uh, when my plan did not come together. And with a, with a few weeks to go, I scrambled to put on a visit to the president, went to Hungary and had a fabulous trip to Budapest. Um, but it was a fundamentally a missed opportunity. And it's the story of US engagement with Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, I, went, I left the White House, I went to Iraq for a year. I left the White House when Ukraine was at the heart of policy debates. It was on the President's agenda, the National Security Council agenda. I went to Iraq for the year um, to serve as a diplomat at the embassy there. I came back after a year um, to the White House again and was pretty shocked to see that Ukraine wasn't really on the agenda. We were kind of sick of it. It was, it was too difficult. This was too, too difficult to work with. And then we found ourselves, as I was back, getting back into European policy, where I had been off for about a year, looking forward to a NATO summit in Bucharest. And it was at the end of uh, 2007, December of 2007, we didn't have a strategy. We didn't have a policy. There wasn't really a conversation about Ukraine, or Georgia for that matter, and how we were going to handle that in Bucharest. And so as we began those deliberations in a more intentional way inside, uh, in Washington, inside the administration, um, the Ukrainians themselves started to organize and speak out, and to a bit to our surprise, managed Yushchenko, Tymoshenko, and Yatsenyuk, who was Speaker of the Rada at the time, to sign a joint letter saying, yes, indeed, we as the three important, uh, as the three leaders representing the branches of the Ukrainian government, we're saying we want a membership action plan at this Bucharest summit in April. We want to begin the process of Ukrainians uh, drawing closer to the alliance. Very controversial in Ukraine, we all know that. Um, but the three leaders came together to articulate that request. And we had a serious review going on inside the U.S. government to try to figure out what to do. Not easy. The Europeans were skeptical. Um, we were very uh, aware of how controversial this was in Ukraine, the lack of public support across the board for that. But we basically faced the question, if the leaders stepped forward and they asked, they asked not to join NATO, but they asked to begin this historic transition process of beginning the path to join NATO, how could we sit back and say, no, this is fundamentally the vision that we want to be able to support, the transition we want to be able to support. And more importantly, the president argued that we needed to be aware that we potentially faced a historic window of opportunity. We couldn't always assume that this would be an option. And did we face a unique, a unique set of circumstances where the West's response would help steer Ukrainian history one way or another? And so we decided to go for it, knowing that the outcome would not be certain. We began intensive negotiations with the Germans because after quite a high-level sort of assessment among leaders in the alliance, we really determined that it was Chancellor Merkel um, that was the most resistant to the idea of membership action plan for Ukraine and Georgia. Um, and we struggled. We struggled in intensive negotiations that went on to this Bucharest summit. Um, and we didn't succeed before the summit, yet we still decided um, finally to do that presidential trip to, to Ukraine. And on the eve of a NATO summit, very intentionally, symbolically, President Bush went to Kyiv to send a very visible, strong signal of U.S. support for Ukraine, Ukraine's democracy, its reform process, but also Ukraine's place within Euro-Atlantic institutions. Um, and then went straight from Kyiv to, to Bucharest, 
where we basically had one of the biggest food fights inside the alliance we had had in over a decade. Um, U.S.-German negotiations didn't succeed in bridging the gap, and as we were facing failure in Bucharest of an ability to come to a decision, the alliance had changed because we had brought in Central and Eastern European leaders. We had brought in the friends of Ukraine. And so as Americans and Germans were getting up and saying we failed to bridge the divide, the Poles, the Romanians, the others in Central Europe stood up and said, this isn't good enough. We're not ready to walk away from this. Berlin, Washington, you don't run this alliance by yourself. And it led to quite intense negotiations with chaos around the NAC table, leaders working this among themselves. And that NATO summit came out with a decision that Georgia and Ukraine will become members of NATO. We didn't decide to begin that process by launching a membership action plan, but we took this very strange, almost profound decision to step over that membership action plan and say, here's our vision. This will happen one day. A pretty profound decision that none of the bureaucrats, none of us diplomats had negotiated in advance. Um, and my point is, is that this was at the heart of that NATO summit. Fast forward four years later, Chicago summit. We're in Chicago, and I was in Chicago, I had a chance to meet with the Ukrainian American community during the NATO summit. This was the NATO summit taking place in a city where the most, uh, uh, where the most of the citizens of Ukrainian descent ever lived. Um, Chicago, what an ideal environment to have a real conversation about Ukraine and its relationship with the West. Yet it was completely off the agenda. You all know uh, President Yanukovych dropped uh, Ukraine's interest in NATO, adopted non-bloc status. Uh, we've heard about the, uh, what's happened on the domestic front. Not a word, not from the Secretary General, not from, uh, not from the United States delegation. I even pinned a, an op-ed on enlargement processes on the eve of that summit. I didn't even mention Ukraine. Um, instead of talking about the potential for Ukraine within the alliance, we're talking about the potential of sanctions against Ukrainian leaders. My, how far we've come in four years. What a shame. That tale of two summits represents the, 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 this historic window and how much that's shifted and what's at stake right now. So why does this still matter? Why does the, what we're talking about here with the elections matter? Well, for me, it still is part of the broader vision. It's this broader context of what we've all been committed to, and it's building this Europe that's whole, that's free, that's at peace, where you actually can't imagine war on the continent of Europe anymore. Enlargement, traditionally the process of enlargement, European Union and NATO enlargement, has made Europe more stable. It's made the alliance stronger. Um, it's been more than about a military alliance. It's been about values. It's been about political identity, key issues for Ukraine's future. And the reality of how it's played out is that NATO has always been the lead driver and the European Union enlargement following through. That dynamic, that recipe is breaking down right now. So what's the context we have? A European Union with a crisis of confidence, about, both about itself and a Eurozone crisis, but certainly about its Eastern policy, its relationship with Ukraine. A Russia that's not shy about talking about its privileged interest in the region, reason, region and is leading forward with initiatives, whether it's the Eurasian Union, the Customs Union, or, or, or CSTO, to consolidate that. And a somewhat ambivalent, somewhat disengaged United States. And if you look back, um, the, the legacy of Ukraine's engagement with the alliance is actually pretty solid. Um, it began in 91 as it joined its first outreach programs. Uh, Ukraine was the first of the CIS members, Commonwealth of Independent States members, to join the Partnership for Peace. Ukraine sent troops to Bosnia with the alliance. Um, we, we, we negotiated a distinctive charter, something to say that the relationship with Ukraine was unique and special um, uh, back in 97. Ukraine sent troops to Kosovo in 99. Under President Kuchma in 2002, Ukraine elaborated the goal of membership within the alliance. Um, in 2005, Yushchenko, we adopted an intensified dialogue on membership issues, taking a step forward under President Yushchenko. Ukraine joined NATO's Mediterranean operation against counterterrorism, sent, uh, force, sent forces into a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan, um, and then in 2008 articulated its desire for membership through a membership action plan, and then in 2010, we all put that on the shelf as Ukraine adopted non-bloc status. I don't even know what non-bloc status means anymore. The Cold War is over. The Yanukovych administration's approach to this is trapped in a Cold War. The Swedes, the most neutral country in Europe, Sweden's not neutral today. They don't even refer to that. And yet here we have Ukraine and its national security strategy saying it's non-bloc status. So we're going through the motions. Defense reform issues are still taking place, but they're crippled by corruption in the security sector. 
But the reality is there's no strategic direction. It's gone. And this isn't about NATO, actually. It is about, it is about Ukraine's democracy. And more importantly, it's about Ukraine and the West. So we all share this vision of a Ukraine that's independent, that's sovereign, um, with strengthened, strong democratic institutions, that's governed by rule of law, prosperous free market, embedded in Europe, in partnership with the United States, um, and at peace with its neighbor Russia. Yet 20 years after Ukraine's independence, Ukraine's young democracy, its cultural identity, its weak institutions, they face political manipulation, and its fragile economy is subject to massive distortions of widespread top-down corruption. So where are we? Ukraine's sovereignty is not guaranteed, its democracy is not inevitable, and its market is not really free. Ukraine right now teeters, I would argue, between a Eurasian sense of Eurasian malaise and an ambivalent Europe. Ukraine's future is in play today. And the decisions that have been taken over the past year, the decisions that have been taken now, they will help determine whether Ukraine evolve, evolves into a European democracy or whether it descends into a post-Soviet authoritarian kleptocracy, which we've warned of in the Sound and the Alarm report. The country really is at a crossroads. It's easy to throw that out, but I would argue that it really is. Much is at stake not just for Ukraine, but for transatlantic interests in the way this evolves. What we've seen under President Yanukovych is a pursuit of contradictory policies. He very clearly has said that he wants to lead Ukraine into Europe and pursue European integration, while at the same time he's been very effectively worked to emasculate his domestic opposition. Um, he's made progress on both. Timoshenko, Lutsenko, they're in jail. He got much further than Timoshenko in negotiating with the European Union an association agreement, a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. He made progress on both of these agenda items. But the reality is that he's going to have to choose. You can't have both, ultimately. And the choice isn't between Russia and the West. That's a false way to frame the argument. It's a false choice. It's not a healthy choice to, to force Ukraine into that way of thinking. But it is a choice of whether Ukraine sees its future in Europe and the European mainstream, or whether it sees itself relegated to the borderlands. And what I fear is that we have an administration, we have a president right now that is seeing that its political preservation is more important than anchoring Ukraine to Europe. I think that's what we're seeing play out that influences why we see selective prosecution of the opposition and why we see ambivalence of this electoral process. Um, I'm not here to, to, to blame and to put a lot of this burden just on President Yanukovych, which I fully agree with what David Kramer said, that what we see today in Ukraine is actually a direct result of the failure indeed the historic failure of the Orange Revolution and the leaders of the Orange Revolution. They carry a massive burden of responsibility as we think about this. But what we've seen under President Yanukovych is a centralization of power. And sure, many people said it was a, an ability to bring order to chaos. There was a lot of chaos in dealing with Ukraine. As a policymaker, we felt it. Um, we've seen Ukraine act relatively responsibly on the international stage by striking an incredibly important deals with the United States on uh, highly enriched uranium and getting it out of the country and securing that material once and for all, of making credible progress on its negotiations with the European Union. But we've also, as we've outlined in the Sounding the Alarm report, we've seen selective prosecutions of the political opposition, more restrictive media environment, disturbing an SBU involvement in, in political affairs, flawed, fundamentally flawed October 2010 local elections, pressure on civil society, an erosion of free speech, consolidation of executive power at the expense of the judiciary, the manipulation of the electoral code, continued rampant corruption. What we see is what we could have expected. The way this clique ruled Donetsk is becoming the way they're ruling Ukraine. So this is kind of depressing. And I, and I, I, would, I do want to say I think it's important for us and for those that care about this, that care about Ukraine, see that this vision, the vision of Ukraine, it's not lost. And it's actually not, as Oris pointed out. The strength of Ukraine is that its diversity actually is a bulwark. Its diversity does serve as a check and balance, whether it's civil society. Um, and so there are these tests that I think we can work with and watch the, the government go through. Um, first is the handling of the political prosecutions, as we've talked about. Um, we had the opportunity to visit Timoshenko. Uh, we were the first when we were there of the Freedom House, De Freedom House delegation earlier this year. We became the first international observers to be granted access to Timoshenko. Uh, in the Kharkiv prison after she'd been transferred to prison right outside Kharkiv. Um, and we had a chance to spend time with her there. 
uh, where it was clear um, that she remained steely determined to fight and to remain a strong political opposition figure. We didn't go there to be an advocate for her as a political candidate. We went to be there as a way to bring shed light on the, the, the corrosive effects of, of criminalizing political differences in Ukraine. We were the second international observers uh, to be able to visit Yuri Lutsenko in prison in Kyiv as well. Um, how that is handled is going to be fundamental. We can come back to that. Second, the parliamentary elections, obviously. We've talked a lot about that. That's a, an enormous test. And third, I'd want to underscore corruption. The handling of corruption, we've argued in our report, and I fundamentally believe, isn't just a nuisance in Ukraine. It is a national security issue. The degree of corruption in Ukraine is actually undermining democracy in Ukraine. It's, it gives an incentive to perpetuate, um, perpetuate remaining in government and to undermine transitions in power. We argued in the report that, that corruption is a cancer in the new side inside Ukraine, suffocating democracy as it metastasizes throughout all public and private organs. Um, and I think, I, I think it's not uh, an insignificant factor to, to I think it's one of the most important factors to face the direct link between the pervasive spread of corruption and the viability of Ukraine's democracy going forward. So, in policy terms, we need to continue to hold the European Union's uh, the Conference of Free Trade Agreement, hold it in abeyance as leverage over, the, over Ukraine and its decisions on some of these issues. We need to be in there big time throughout this electoral process as we have been and been <coughs> with monitors, as Oris will be part of that. Uh, parallel vote counts and all the things that go into helping to contribute to a free and fair election. We need to not disengage from Ukraine, but rather shine a spotlight on Ukraine right now as these pivotal decisions are playing out. Um, we actually should be in, with, be working very closely with Ukraine on its on energy security and its energy efficiency. One of the biggest issues related to determining Ukraine's sovereignty, its independence from Russia, is its energy policy. The development of shale gas in Ukraine today, where we've actually seen a cooperative Ukrainian government welcoming Western investment, investment Chevron, Royal Dutch Shell, this is a potential game changer in being able to change the nature of Ukraine's dependency on Russia. And the scale of shale gas in the coming years can give Ukraine options over its independence and sovereignty. And we need to be in there working to help bring transparency to the entire energy sector, energy efficiency programs, which actually reduce Ukraine's dependency on Russian gas and developing these shale gas fields is a fundamental strategy to the further preservation of Ukraine's independence. And we also need to be continuing to develop military to military ties. We saw during the Orange Revolution, when it was touch and go at a certain time, that we actually were concerned about the use of security sector forces to crack down on the opposition. But the ties that we had built up through the Partnership for Peace over, over the years, they helped sow seeds of doubt, we believe. Uh, and decision makers in Kyiv at the time, that if they call the security services out, would they actually respond against Ukrainian citizens? And sowing that doubt is critical. So no matter what happens politically in Ukraine, keeping mill-to-mill -mill ties developing where we have professional military contacts remains one of the most important things we can do. So uh, we just need to be careful that as we move forward with Ukraine on issues like energy, on the highly enriched uranium deal, that we don't give Ukraine a pass on democracy because that erodes all everything, everything else. Um, this is where we need to begin to continue to check the democratic backsliding in Ukraine. Go on offense in terms of the integration of the Ukrainian people into Europe, into education exchanges, into the, into the visa issue, being able to have the Europeanization of the Ukrainian population even as government to government relations suffer, to be focused increasingly on the integration of our economies, rule of law, um, to back its sovereignty as Ukraine faces uh, uh, the Kremlin effort of the Eurasian Union, uh, and to really work with Ukraine and its OSCE chairmanship that that not become a debacle and a mockery of its own democracy, but that we use its OSCE chairmanship to make real progress on issues like Transnistria and Moldova, on conventional forces in Europe, uh, and to make Ukraine stand firmly beside the election monitoring parts of the OSCE. So why does this matter? So Ukraine has a population the size of Spain, a land mass the size of France. It's a major actor in Europe. But the history of instability in Europe, part of the history of instability in Europe has been uncertainty between the lands between Germany and Russia. And that's why its future not being in the gray zone, I think, is so important. But what happens in Ukraine, I also would argue, is the best hope for change in Russia over the long term. Ukraine's failure will validate Putin's argument that democracy is dangerous. 
um, it will value that validate this perception of Ukraine as our backward cousins to the south, rather than helping to begin this historic process of changing the Russian psyche to accepting in Ukraine that it is truly independent, a separate nation. So Ukraine is at a crossroads. Its democracy is its play. Its, its democracy is in play. Its place in Europe is in play. And its reliability as a partner on the international stage is in play. <clears throat> so part of this is a discussion about how do you restore the idea of Ukraine in the West as part of an objective of Ukrainian policy. Ukraine has to want it. It's an issue of political will and leadership, an issue of education of the Ukrainian population that frankly still sees something like NATO through a Cold War prism. Um, but it's laying, I think right now what we have to be cognizant of is laying the groundwork for policies until the time is opportune to be able to advance this agenda. Um, and so it's easy to think of a historic window of opportunity that only the Baltic states escaped and got through to a future embedded in Europe. I think that would be a shame to see this door closed. We need to be thinking about how to work through this period right now, not just for Ukraine, but for Ukraine, for Moldova, to Georgia, to show that post-Soviet states can succeed in the experience of becoming free market democracies linked increasingly to Europe and embedded increasingly in the West, and that ultimately that's a vision, ultimately that's a vision and a plan that includes Russia in that equation as well. So with that, let me conclude and turn it back over to our moderator. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I thank all the speakers. Uh, it is now time to uh, become more interactive. And um, I would uh, invite you to uh, raise your hand and pose your questions. Uh, will you be, and we, have, we do have a wandering mic, or maybe even two on the audience to uh, help help us <coughs> hear the questions better. Uh, well, uh, I see Nadia Kravitz has her hand up. Uh, Nadia Kravitz, also from Public Institute. Thank you for a uh, fascinating talk, both on uh, internal and international problems in Ukraine. And I have four questions. Two of them will go to Oris and David, if I may, and the last two will go to David. Um, so Oris and David, both of you have made a link between the nature of the Ukrainian regime, partially free, less democratic, and so on, and Ukraine's independence and sovereignty. And I'd like for you to expand on how does this development impact Ukraine's ability to be more independent and sovereign. Um, and another question, so within that realm as well, is how, what's the relationship between Ukraine's democratic aggression and its ability to govern? Uh, that is to say, there has been a discussion saying that Ukraine during the Yulia and uh, um, Yushchenko's time has been chaotic, unstable, and so on, and a strong hand was needed in order to get things in order. And arguably, that has gotten better. Um, so, if you could expand on this relationship, that would be great. A question for Damon. Um, well, I guess the first one is that um, I would disagree with you on the notion of ambivalence as destructive to European security. I think Ukraine's ambivalence could be constructive in some way. Um, and certainly Russia's resistance to further NATO enlargement has to do a lot with the way in which Ukraine has constructed this non bloc status, whatever it means. Um, so in that sense, I think Ukrainian leaders of today do understand the gray zone as the only way in which they could be secure. Um, and perhaps the way in which they do see the world is that they have to make a choice, and they are reluctant to make the choice between either the West or Russia, arguing that um, Europe would be much more prosperous and secure if Ukraine does not make a strong decision. So if you could comment on that, that would be great. Um, and I think the, the, the other question that I wanted to see is that in your presentation, I didn't see at all your reflections of what Ukrainian the Ukrainians themselves, the people think about its place in Europe or in the world. And it was very much a Western led or European led or NATO led vision of what um, Ukraine should look like um, in Europe and, and, and transatlantic relations more broadly. So if you could again expand on how do you think this should matter or whether it should matter at all? At the end of the day, both EU and NATO markets are very much elite led processes. So should the Ukrainian population be um, counted in this? Thank you. David and Oris, and then we'll turn to Damon. And please raise your hands to those others, and I'll put you on the list. 
Uh, sure. I'll be try to be uh, brief on this. On the nature of the regime and the threat that that poses to the country's independence and uh, future, the, the risk is that as Ukraine's leadership winds up pursuing the path that it's on, it will wind up increasingly isolated from the from the West. That means it will be left to Russia in terms of foreign policy. And that, I would argue, is not a situation Ukraine wants to be in. As Damon said, there is a sense both in Europe and in the United States that Ukraine is a problem, not a problem solver. And with Europe and the United States having so many problems already, taking on the problem of Ukraine is something that there's no appetite for. And what that means, unfortunately, and this is obviously something none of us is recommending, is that the European countries, the EU and the United States, will simply stop paying attention to Ukraine. And, and the reason for that is not lack of interest. It's because there have been so many years of trying, as Damon explained, just with NATO, of trying to help Ukraine, but Ukraine's leadership showing a lack of interest and in reciprocating. Uh, it, it does get a little bit to your point about what do the Ukrainian people want, but I'll, I'll let Damon address that. Um, so I, I would argue that as the leadership continues on this uh, familyization path, on this path of cracking down against opposition, and moving in a more authoritarian direction, a more kleptocratic direction, that that will wind up leaving Ukraine vulnerable to, to its big neighbor. Um, and I don't think that's healthy for Ukraine's independence or, or its future. In terms of the democratic regression and ability to govern and the need for a strong hand, it's, it's maybe in the context of comparing it to the orange period, which was a, a period of total mismanagement, of endless infighting, um, and a focus much more on who was on top and who was not between uh, Yushchenko and Timoshenko. Um, and even when Yanukovych was prime minister to make sure he didn't acquire too much power. Um, it doesn't take much to look more uh, effective um, than the previous government of the Orange leadership. But um, there are limits to uh, the ability of a strong hand to deliver. If it was really delivering, if it was doing a better job, I would argue that the Party of Regents and Yanukovych would be much higher in its ratings than the 23%, which I think the last poll suggested as the election approaches. It, it does suggest that many Ukrainians view the current leadership not as delivering on promises, but as stealing. Um, and it's taking advantage of, of the, the phrase I used before, that it's their turn now to steal. There's no sense of, of, the, of the common good. There's a sense of what's mine. And I think that's a terrible thing that is, again, not unique to Ukraine, but it's really, coming back to your first question, undermining Ukraine's future. I really don't have that much to add except, um, you know, I believe the greatest threat to Ukraine's independence is not Russia. As David had indicated, it is corruption and lack of rule of law. Of course, the two are uh, intimately linked. Um, uh, one of the benefits of uh, EU integration, obviously, is not economic, but what would happen is they would have to reduce their level of corruption just by virtue of the fact of adopting the formal EU standards. It doesn't mean they would rid themselves of corruption, as we know corruption exists in the EU, including in some of the newer members of like Romania and Bulgaria in particular. But, you know, it's all a matter of degree. And, and the corrosive effect of corruption in Ukraine, which, as uh, either Damon or David or somebody said, has become exponentially worse, is just unbelievable. I, there, there's no single greater problem. And, of course, as David indicated, it's not the EU that takes advantage of Ukraine's corruption. We all know, you know, who, who Ukraine is vulnerable to as a result of, of that corruption, lack of rule of law. Um, I don't really have anything. The only thing I'll add to the second question is that it, it's interesting about what you said about a strong hand, because even though you have democratic regression in the Yanukovych government, um, and supposedly a strong hand in some respects. But my understanding, too, that is not a perfect system, and it is not the most efficient of governments, and even a lot of the people um, down 
the Vecta Calvar on the Rayon or Oblast levels sort of do their own thing. You know, they play their game with Kiev. They, they listen where they have to, and then they do their own thing, kind of. So it, it's just an interesting uh, a dynamic there, perhaps. You know, they're not sufficiently dictatorial, if you will, to get their way on everything. Not that you're advocating for that. No, by no means. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. Uh, the first one, I think, in terms of, I guess, uh, a Ukrainian foreign policy that's, that's premised, as we see, on balancing um, Ukraine's relations with the West and with Russia, while at the same time working towards European integration, actually can make quite a bit of sense in the given circumstances. Um, and I think what's happening is that Ukraine's field for maneuver is narrowing. And so that it's not able to balance West and, and Russia as it, as it actually moves forward on integration with Europe. Because what's happening internally has stalled the second objective, the integration with Europe. And I think that's what risks sort of a perpetuation of an unhealthy gray zone rather than a, a, a more positive uh, gray zone. I think the more that Ukraine is embedded in situations where its stock, its independence is beyond doubt, beyond question, it provides more predictability and stability over time. The United States is trying to improve its relations with Russia. You wouldn't expect Ukraine to do otherwise. So uh, I, think, um, uh, I think that makes quite a bit of sense, but for Ukraine to navigate that in an effective way, it needs to be able to be moving forward on its Western agenda, and that's what its internal that stall that part of its foreign policy strategy, therefore narrowing its options in terms of maneuver. Um, the issue, yes, the issue, and I offered some personal views on the NATO front, which are a little controversial. Um, this, uh, NATO isn't interested in Ukraine right now. Nobody in the West is, that's not even a conversation that folks are pushing as I sort of frame my remarks with. Um, it is an elite-led process. It's been an elite-led process throughout Central and Eastern Europe as these countries have, have gone through, and you've seen varying degrees of support. So what was happening several years ago is you had three leaders in power willing to articulate this as an objective, and therefore incumbent upon us to respond to that. Yanukovych has taken it off the table. Fine, he actually has taken it off the table. It's not the operative issue. It's more the European Union, not the alliance right now. Um, I do think, at the end of the day, the population does matter. These have been elite-driven projects throughout Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and you saw, for example, the Baltic states, very high level public support on the front. But you also saw in Hungary, in Slovakia, Slovenia, um, very low levels of support, particularly for NATO during the enlargement process. Uh, that doesn't change. That doesn't begin to be effective until there's a um, clarity, lack of ambivalence among the government, and usually government and opposition to help shape public opinion. President Obama, uh, in a speech in Moscow, explicitly stated as much that as we think about the future kind of future countries going into euro and institutions, um, that popular opinion does matter as an explicit factor. We've never articulated it as succinctly, as precisely for US policy as he did at the time. Um, but it's not, it shouldn't be a Western-driven process. It should be the West open and responsive to it. I have personal strong views about it, but as U.S. policy, um, we're not going to drive it. It will actually have to be driven from Ukraine. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaking of exponentially, which someone here used, uh, the list of uh, questions is growing exponentially as our time is diminishing also exponentially. That's for sure. So I would ask uh, that you keep your questions uh, to one and perhaps uh, as concise as you can. We will have a reception following this, which will allow you also to interact with our speakers uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, perhaps. Uh, so you will still have a chance to uh, ask a question if we are not able to do that right now. Uh, I will call people in the order in which I've seen their hands. Uh, Mr. Isayu, to be followed by Mr. Kovarezny on the side. We'll take a couple of well, let us do it. Yes, that is actually uh, a good idea. It's uh, more efficient, perhaps. We'll take maybe two uh, two questions, maybe even three questions at a time. Mr. Isaiah, Mr. Bobrajny, and I believe you had your hand up. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Haida. Uh, my name is Christopher Isayu. I'm actually currently a uh, editorial assistant at 
say is maybe all three of our distinguished panelists could, could take, a, take a shot at it. Um, uh, Mr. Kramer, you, you made a, a comment initially that, and, and Mr. Dejkiewski also echoed it, that uh, essentially Ukraine's biggest problems or enemy is not so much Russia, um, however, its own internal corruption. I think all of you made a great uh, compelling case for that. Um, however, given that, um, I, I recently completed and, and successfully defended a, a thesis for my master's uh, in international affairs that looked at uh, Putin's uh, rhetoric and neo-nationalist rhetoric in three case studies and all tied it in very quickly. Um, one case study was the Orange Revolution, uh, the second case study was Chechnya, and the third case study was the uh, Five Day or Summer War of August 2008. Um, basically, by looking at Putin's own speeches and proclamations, um, it was pretty obvious, and, and it's been echoed by other foreign policy scholars that I you know, use as well, that Putin has essentially had a, a very uh, deliberate policy of not necessarily revamping the Soviet Union, but extending uh, Russia's privileged sphere, the sphere of hegemony, its historical Eurasian power status, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, David, you mentioned the uh, 2008 Bucharest summit. I was surprised you didn't mention Putin's infamous statement on Ukraine at that summit, where he most famously said that Ukraine is not a real country. Um, as recent as that, we've seen Putin you know, continuously overplaying his hand, as, as Mr. Kramer alluded to. So I guess, feeding off of that, um, my question is, I guess, somewhat twofold. Um, how does, um, I guess, uh, how can the, rat, the West um, what can the West do, especially NATO, EU, uh, the next administration, the current administration, to re-engage um, Ukraine and um, diminish, I guess, the, the influence of Russia? To what extent, um, maybe where does the Russian influence of corruption and encouraging corruption and disorder in Ukraine stop in Ukraine's own internal discord end? And I guess, um, very quickly, the final part of the question would be maybe directed more towards uh, Damon. Um, given also NATO's uh, failure, uh, say for example in the, in the Five Day Second War, to uh, really step up to the plate and help out uh, Shakashvili and you know, do anything against Russia, and the fact that um, the Georgians themselves had a very uh, a highly trained U.S. military unit engaged in, in uh, Afghanistan that came late to the fight, it could have made a theoretically a difference, and the public opinion in, in current Ukraine against joining the NATO. Um, I guess how, how does how does Obama in the West be engaged? Um, okay, we'll have to try a little harder for consistency. <laughs> <laughs> the next round. Uh, perhaps we'll address these and then continue uh, uh, so as not to overload. Please. I, I, to be clear, I, I, uh, to be clear, I uh, certainly um, carry no brief for Putin. Um, I'm one of the loudest advocates for the Magnitsky Act in Washington to impose a visa ban and asset freeze against Russian officials involved in gross human rights abuses. I've been a long-time critic of his. I think he is a danger. I'm not sure he's the number one geopolitical foe, but he's certainly uh, not, not a woman fuzzy friend. Um, but his ability to expand Russia's influence in the region has been both successful and an abysmal failure. Uh, the CIS is an abysmal failure. It wasn't started on Putin, of course. But his efforts even to get the uh, economic union, the Eurasian Union together, has failed. Um, and these countries just see Russia as a threat. Now, sometimes it's a threat that they have to cave to out of survival, a sense of self-survival. But um, Putin, as you indicated in his comments, both at, at Bucharest, his comments in Munich in, in February 2007, um, after Beslan in September 2004, when he was describing outside forces trying to take a piece of, of Russia. Um, his comparison in the United States to the Third Reich in 2007. Not a subtle guy. Um, and that subtlety, or lack of subtlety, rather, I think has a tendency to repel rather than attract. Um, so I, I do tend to think that 
um, Russia's ability to uh, return to any semblance of, of the Soviet Union is doomed to failure. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it won't have influence in some of its neighbors. It has significant influence over some. Armenia, for example, uh, where there's significant influence. Some of the Central Asian states, but even there, it's, it's on the wane, it's not on the rise. So, um, and then on how to uh, reduce corruption, um, buy them a lot of mirrors. Um, if they want to see the root of the problem, they got to look in the mirror, because the problem is there. Um, they, they have to, we, we have to stress, uh, I guess I would say, stress principles and institutions, rule of law. Um, and if they don't pursue it, or as mentioned, sanctions, Damon touched on it, the talk of sanctions, I would argue, is largely out of frustration. Europeans and American leaders have tried in many different ways, including by boycotting the, the Euro championships in, in Ukraine uh, this past spring and summer. It, nothing's gotten through. And so it's more out of frustration than anything else that there is this talk in both Europe and the United States of sanctions. Because we're, we're, we're scratching our heads figuring out how do we get the attention of these guys, and not just Yanukovych, all of them, to understand that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. I'll just, because uh, you had questions that I think Damon will answer, I'll, I'll just add to it something that David said, and I agree. You know, it's one thing to have a deliberate policy, uh, a, a de de rhetoric, which Putin's has, and even a deliberate policy, another thing to implement it. And by the way, I don't want to minimize the danger of, of, of Russia and um, what that's posed even historically to Ukraine. You know, I think that's, that's pretty obvious. But R Russia is kind of limited right now in what can do, and you know, one example uh, of that, for me at least, that really sort of resonated with me is after the Georgian War, the invasion, I should say, of uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, who recognized it? Not one post-Soviet country, even their friends, even Belarus. Speaking of Belarus, uh, obviously Belarus is very vulnerable, especially economically, because of their own unreformed econo uh, economy to Russia. But do you think Lukashenko and Putin love each other? Uh, by no means. And Lukashenko, it's, it's a constant little battle of, you know, uh, Lukashenko trying to resist Russian influence. Uh, not in the way he should. If he really wanted to do it, he would uh, sort of start to uh, democratize or at least begin the process. I think even if he began, you'd have an EU waiting for him with open arms. But he hasn't, if anything, he's move back even further. Um, so, and also keep in mind, I think, Russia's own internal problems. The North Caucasus, you know, you have a low-grade guerrilla warfare going on there. The demographic disaster, their own governance, uh, you know, is nothing to write home about. So there are a lot of vulnerabilities. Russia's um, Russia's not what it was in the past. Uh, having said that, it could be dangerous, but with respect to Ukraine, um, and you know, as opposed to Belarus, Ukraine has a, a lot of, um, Ukraine is a lot less vulnerable for a lot of reasons, including because it does have a greater degree of democracy uh, and has a more, shall we say, Europe-oriented population more civil society and whatnot. So it could better withstand, uh, I think, Russian pressure. Additionally, uh, even the more Russo-oriented uh, Ukrainian oligarchs uh, are not exactly happy with Russia these days. And relations, as you know, between Yanukovych and Putin are pretty dismal. Um, Russia's perhaps been a little bit too aggressive, even on the economic front, uh, in some instances. Uh, and the Ukrainian oligarchs aren't exactly happy with that, so you have some resistance there. So um, I, you can't minimize Russia, and believe me, I don't want to do that, but they're not the biggest threat right now to Ukraine, I think. Be fairly brief, but I think you're right to signal, uh, point out some of Putin's more outrageous comments.
flood version policy is smoke and mirrors. I mean, if you look at Eurasian Union, you look at CSD area, they're all kind of failures. Um, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in Russian policy. But I think one of the painful lessons I learned in 2008 in the Georgia War is that we've become immune to outrageous Russian statements and behavior so that we actually begin to accept the unacceptable. So in the run-up to the 2008 war in Georgia, we saw tons of signs about worsening of what was happening with Russia and Georgia. But each step of egregious behavior became sort of a reaction of, well, that's how Russia is. It, it, has, it says outrageous things, does unacceptable things. And if you don't check, if you don't respond, if you don't mark those, we felt we got burned badly in 2008 in Georgia. Um, you know, but part of this is, I think, as is, is my colleagues have pointed out, I had the opportunity to hear from Timoshenko and talk to her about how Putin dealt with her when she was prime minister. We've heard the same from President Yanukovych in his conversations with Putin. And both of them said the exact same thing, that when they have meetings with Putin, the vulgarity of the language he uses is meant to convey to them that they are peasants, that they, he looks down on them. The, the language he uses is meant to humiliate them. How do you think a Ukrainian leader who might have been predisposed to trying to strike a bargain with Russia feels when they come through that experience? Not good. And I think we've even seen with President Yanukovych, who began his presidency with massive concessions towards Russia, uh, taking NATO off the table, table reconsidering the interpretation of Holmodor, uh, and a car keep deal by extending the Black Sea Fleet, that his concessions to Russia didn't satiate the Kremlin's appetite, it actually only whetted the Kremlin's appetite. And you've seen Yanukovych change his behavior. So frankly, the Russians are their own worst enemies sometimes in, in how uh, other post-Soviet states respond. But your question was, how do we re-engage Ukraine, perhaps even to diminish Russian interests? I think just two areas that signal, again, energy. The irony of energy being the most corrupt sector in Ukraine, it also offers the greatest promise for fundamentally changing the dynamic between Ukraine and Russia. I think a shale gas revolution in Ukraine can represent as dramatic change of the dynamic of Ukraine's dependency on Moscow. Um, and second is, even when there are difficulties in government-to-government -government relations, we have to remain focused on civil society, on you know, the Freedom Support Act in the Congress. We're going to be cutting our funding, but the money that we put into judiciary assistance, into rule of law, into exchange programs, into cultural issues, all of these things are the most important things for laying the ground and seeding sort of a, the Ukrainian population that sees other options. But can I just add very quickly, Damon mentioned energy. Uh, my greatest concern is the export of Russia's uh, largest thing, and that's corruption. Um, and look at Russ Ukrainego, the middleman energy company, which is now back doing extraordinarily well, uh, which has a very strong and active Russian connection. It, they need to get serious about eliminating that again. And for all her faults and for the not very good gas deal that Timoshenko signed in 2009, she did at least get rid of Ross Ukrainergo. It's back. Um, and as long as there are people in very high level positions in Ukraine who have a vested interest in keeping it going, that that's going to be a huge problem. Uh, I will extend uh, our discussion period by five minutes, but even so, that gives us about 10 minutes. So uh, please uh, ask your question according to the succinct Mr. Uh, my remarks directed primarily to David Kramer. Um, I have no disagreement with the, uh, your description or analysis of the situation in Ukraine as well as the other panelists. But I do have a concern with the way you frame it. And it's a little bit ironic because it's coming from the head of the Freedom House. Because the way you frame the biggest problems in Ukraine primarily on the point of democracy, deterioration, and increase of corruption. And very little said about liberties per se. In my, my view, actually, that neither uh, democracy nor corruption is a problem in Ukraine to the extent that you describe it uh, simply on the point of the definition of what those two things are. My, my biggest concern is that, the, or rather, the biggest problem that I see in Ukraine is the issue with um, liberty, that is the rule of law and the separation, or rather I uh, independence of the judiciary, which leads to two things, the uh, lack of rule of law, and that's where we have corruption, of course, if there is no rule of law, then what's, what's to corrupt, right? And in terms of democracy, I now understand that in American uh, context, when democracy is spoken of, the 
what is meant as liberal democracy. But in the Ukrainian context, there is a, a life of democracy with all kinds of flaws, but extremely difficult to protect individual liberties. Again, because there are lack, lack of rule of law. So, not the description, but the frame uh, work that you present, and it's it's not just here, but you can hear this kind of uh, uh, framing of the uh, situation throughout media, and that is a little bit misleading as far as I can tell. Let's take one more question on this side, and then we turn to our panelists. Uh, speaking of the relation of uh, internal events in Ukraine to international affairs, uh, last year in February of 2011, uh, Dira Abu Sisi, a Palestinian engineer with a uh, Ukrainian wife and a valid passport, was abducted from a train in Ukraine by Mossad agents and whisked off to Israel's Gulag, where he's been in solitary confinement uh, ever since. Uh, what do you know about the... Uh, complicity of the Ukrainian government uh, in the shocking uh, human rights abuse on its own soil by a foreign government. Okay, something very, shall we say, general and something very specific. Uh, who will want to tackle this? Um, well, I think the first one is directed at me. Yeah, the first one, yes. Um, look, I, I thought I was pretty clear about how the current government has undermined the independence of the judiciary. It's using the judicial process and the prosecution process for political purposes to advance its own agenda. Um, it is undermining the rule of law. There's no question about it. I also mentioned uh, crackdowns on freedom of assembly, fundamental freedoms. Um, the freedoms of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of expression. Um, so maybe it's just a, a matter of semantics, I'm not sure. On, on liberal democracy, I don't use the term liberal democracy. I use democracy without an adjective in front of it. And when I talk about democracy, and as I talk about as the head of an organization that is a democracy and human rights organization, in fact, the oldest one in the U.S., I mean uh, free and fair elections uh, with the ability to compete. I mean rule of law and independent institutions. I mean a, a free uh, and vibrant press. And I mean civil society. Those, those are the ingredients of the democracy, whether you use liberal or anything else. Moreover, when we talk about these things, um, we talk about universal values, which is also, I think, good when you're getting at liberties. Um, universal values include the ones that I identified, and I think a number of those are under threat. Our, in our rankings, Ukraine is partly free. It's not, not free. Russia, in our view, is not free. Uh, Belarus is not free. Ukraine hasn't reached that point, and I certainly hope it won't. Um, on the question, I don't know if uh, Forrest and Damon have yeah, anything. I, I don't have anything for you. I'm sorry. Does anybody? Sorry. sorry. Uh, and I believe this will be the last two, Oleg Kutsuba, and then I think we have another one. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, my name is Oleg Kutsuba. I'm uh, in the Slavic department and I'm also the editor of the online edition of the PA journal Critica. Um, the picture that you uh, paint is pretty bleak, but the question is ultimately what can be done? How do you identify the healthy parts of the Ukrainian society? And what can your respective organization do to support them? And I'm speaking in particular from the point of view of Ukrainian intellectuals and journalists who see a way to participate in that. And on this side, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Judge Schwartz, uh, writer. And uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the wake of the end of the Cold War, there was the, uh, the demise of Marxism, or the putative, the apparent demise of Marxism. There appears to be some kind of uh, ideological uh, desert that, uh, is, that has become the context in which uh, political events and struggles occur in Ukraine from, from your comments, like about the food fight. Uh, my question is, uh, in Europe and in the United States, the, the lines of ideological uh, conflict seem to center around the question of uh, uh, economics, uh, whether, whether to do uh, austerity to try, and uh, to, to try and deal with the current uh, 
economic nexus or not. Does, does this polarity apply in the Ukraine? Is, do you have a debt problem in, in Ukraine? And if so, are you arguing about whether to stimulate the economy with transfer payments, welfare-like transfer payments? Or are you arguing instead that the, the, uh, the, the poor should uh, tighten their belts and that the, uh, the kleptocrats should have free reign? Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll just start out and answer this answer, uh, perhaps at the beginning, answer Mr. Um, in terms of institutionally, uh, what we can do in the Helsinki Commission, I don't make it too narrow, but Continue this mic on. Is it working? It says it's being a little closer than. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you know, Ukraine undertook uh, certain commitments when it signed the Helsinki Final Act, even when it was independent. There was a signature process that went in it. There's many OSC agreements in a whole range of areas security, trade, and economic, uh, human rights, and democracy national minorities, you name it, it covers the gamut, tolerance issues. Um, and really what we can do and we try to do is uh, keep their feet to the fire, you know, and to try to hold Ukraine politically accountable because there are no enforcement mechanisms within the OSC process, uh, but to hold them accountable and sometimes, to put it bluntly, to try to shame people who violate freely undertake commitments. I'm not sure that's where your question's getting at, but that's certainly one thing we can do. And to that end, sometimes via congressional legislation, um, that's where, for example, uh, the idea, it was frustration, but it's a, also a, a vehicle for tr trying to begin the process of holding, you know, violators accountable through personal targeted sanctions. Nobody's talking about, uh, like I said, with respect to Ukraine, you know, broad economic sanctions. Nobody wants that, you know, and everybody in Washington understands Ukraine's geopolitical importance, etc., etc., etc. It's almost become a mantra and everybody knows that without, you know, with, uh, without Ukraine, if you will, Russia cannot be an empire inimicable to our interests, okay? That, that's a given. Uh, but, you know, sanctions, limited targeted sanctions, even U.S. visa bans or personal asset freezes against certain individuals, it kind of punctuates our concerns. So those are some things we could do. Uh, of course, there are all sorts of other things, if I could sort of interpret your question correctly, we could do in a positive way, which is continue, even though funding is going to get cut, but through various ways, exchanges, some degree of funding, you know, exchange of experience, academic, et cetera, et cetera, to try to help build civil society in Ukraine, because the, the civil society is really the key to help. And to this gentleman's question? Uh, well, I, let me just, just oh, sorry. Uh, on, I agree with what Orr said. Civil society, I think, is the key. Um, and civil society, as I mentioned in my remarks, I think is the most promising area in Ukraine as well. But Oris is also absolutely right, which is right now, the Ukrainian leadership does not see a price to be paid for engaging in the behavior that it has. And we need to show that there is a penalty for this kind of action and behavior. Uh, That's why I'm unfortunately, and very sadly, moving in favor of supporting these targeted sanctions that Oris talked about. Um, on sort of the economic question, the ideological desert, I'm happy that there's an ideological desert. I think uh, the ideology of the communist period was more than enough for our lifetimes. Um, but uh, I guess the economics are obviously are critically important as we keep hearing in our own election here. But what is striking to me is that um, with the largest decline in GDP in 2009 of any state in Eurasia of, what, 14.9%, Timoshenko came within a little, over, a little under four percentage points of winning the election. Um, it suggests that there is a fairly high tolerance for economic ineptitude on the part of uh, Ukraine's leadership um, among the population. And 
but I think there is a growing uh, frustration and lack of patience for the kind of corrupt leadership that, that we're seeing. So I hate to keep harping on this, but I actually think the issue of corruption, which has an impact on a country's ability to thrive economically, is a bigger concern than actually having the economy, uh, than focusing on the economic issues. Just had uh, two quick answers to both questions. Uh, when we've had a chance to um, visit Ukraine, uh, we spend a lot of time with civil society. And it's always um, impressive to me how many organizations, how active civil society is in, in Ukraine, and how much it remains a, a strong voice. Um, and I think it will continue to do so. The most compelling uh, time we had in Ukraine was when we went to the, and we spent some time with uh, the students at Ukraine Catholic University. Um, and this was after we had just left Harky, where we had a little bit of a public food fight with the mayor there who frankly stole his election. And, uh, and we were in Lviv, uh, and it was one of the most inspirational things to listen to um, Ukraine's future concern, despairing sometimes, um, believing this was the only place they could go without having to pay for their grades, but being fired up about it and having uh, clarity moral clarity in their compass as they think about the future and their future. Um, and it was really quite inspiring at the end of our trip. Um, and so there's a lot of, I mean, the human resources in Ukraine are the most valuable asset, I think, to, to this, this equation. At the Atlantic Council, part of what we see as our mission is helping to galvanize support in the West, in particular Washington, um, for continued U.S. engagement and leadership in Europe, and specifically Europe's East and Ukraine. And I think that's a risk. It's uh, not so often that uh, Washington's focus is really on Kiev as much as uh, it has been in the past. And so we make an effort as part of what we call our Complete Europe Program, the unfinished business of US engagement to help him realize a Europe whole free and a peace that includes Ukraine. Um, we also are open to partnering with Ukrainian institutions and intellectuals on projects, on particular efforts that are about uh, Ukraine's commitment to Atlanticism. Um, and then the ideological polarity. Um, I mean, one of the realities is that Timoshenko's economic policy was often seen as populist, was often seen as pandering, um, and the international business community uh, was not completely comfortable <laughs> um, with macroeconomic policy. She uh, presided over the biggest decrease in Ukrainian GDP, part of the global downturn, but still she was in a leadership role. And much of the business community responded very positively to regions coming to power because they were, they expected and in some degrees received a more predictable economic environment in which to operate. Um, but I think is what we've seen is that the government, while it took steps to resolve some high-profile commercial cases that had been really an irritant, for example, in U.S.-Ukrainian relations over the years, the Yanukovych administration resolved many of these in its first year in office that it's been seen as a more transactional set of dealing with business and these issues rather than creating this, this systemic uh, macroeconomic environment for sustained growth on the basis of a predictable judiciary rule of law that then more, more responsive on transactional issues. So unfortunately, I don't think this plays out in the Ukrainian body politic as a clarity between camps. I think we have a lot more personality-driven politics. Uh, but there is that underlying element, and I would hope over time in Ukrainian politics you would see more of an ideological, not great ideology, ideologicalism, the, the confrontation of the Cold War, but more of a battle of ideas rather than a battle of identity or a battle of personality. Uh, could I, one quick follow-up? Uh, I'm afraid that we are uh, exactly run up. Uh, you will have an opportunity, I think, uh, perhaps to come up uh, afterwards to our speakers, but we have run almost 15 minutes over time, and I know there are other people with questions, but I must apologize. Uh, you will have to uh, you know, hold your questions and, uh, to the extent possible, speak to our uh, distinguished panelists uh, afterwards. But there is a reception that is waiting for us across the street. Uh, let me uh, thank uh, all of you who have come here to this lecture to honor also the memory of our colleague, Zinia Sokor Perry, uh, to thank the family who have so faithfully attended all these uh, events over the years, and to thank our speakers. Uh,
David Kramer, Marcelo Tchutinski, David Wilson.